Trigonometry, Chapter 5, Trigonometric Identities, Section 2, Verifying Trigonometric Identities, Video 6, Verifying an Identity, Example 5. This series is based on content from Pearson's Trigonometry 12th edition by Lyle, Hornsby, Schneider, and Daniels. Verify the identity. 1 minus cosine x over 1 plus cosine x equals the square of cotangent x minus cosecant x. Hmm, where should we start? Well, two things jump out at me. Number one, both of these sides are a little bit messed up. Transforming one to the other might not be the ideal move. So I think we're going to transform both sides into the same third expression. And once they're equal, the identity has been verified. So let's start with the left side. The 1 minus cosine x over 1 plus cosine x. What options do we have for manipulating that? Is there any trigonometric option? I would argue not really. Uh, what are you going to do? Is there an algebraic option? I would argue yes, there is, because this is the exact setup mentioned in the list of algebraic maneuvers, where multiplying both sides by a conjugate is an ideal situation. Specifically, if the denominator had a one and a cosine squared, we could use a Pythagorean identity on it in some capacity, hopefully in an effort to condense it to a single term. So we're gonna hit both sides with the conjugate of the denominator. Remember, conjugate of an addition problem is the corresponding subtraction problem. So let's multiply both sides by this. And the minute I wrote this, I realized that I see a path directly from the left to the right. Now, I'm going to take that path, but understand that it would be okay to manipulate the left side, manipulate the right side, and have them meet in the middle. But I want to use this as an opportunity to show you another algebraic maneuver. All right, so let's see what happens as a consequence of this. Uh, this is an algebra move, so we're not doing trig yet. On the top, we get 1 minus cosine times itself, and I could foil it out, but I'm going to leave it intact. And on the bottom, when we multiply a number of times its conjugate, we get the difference of the squares, so we get 1 minus cosine squared of x. Now, why did I leave the 1 minus cosine up top with the square instead of foiling it out? Because look at the right side of our, our identity. We're trying to get a squared subtraction problem. We just created a squared subtraction problem. That has to be on the right path. So I'm going to leave that intact for a moment, and let's manipulate the denominator. The numerator is still the same. But the denominator is just sine squared of x, and that's a Pythagorean identity. Now, here's another way to analyze where you are versus where you want to be. Where I currently am is a squared subtraction problem over something. And what I want is just a squared subtraction problem. My final destination is not a giant fraction. My final destination is a giant squared binomial or a squared binomial. So somehow I have to make the fraction not the focal point of where we currently are. Right now, where we currently are right here is one big fraction, and I don't want it that way. The way to fix that algebraically is to sneak the sine squared into the parentheses. Now, how can I do that? Well, notice that the sine has a square, and so does the 1 minus cosine x. Because both are squared, I can condense them into a single squared parentheses. And again, this is just an algebra move. Now, at this point, I've run out of space, so I know what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to have to switch to a PDF and continue this, but let me kind of describe what's going to happen next. Notice the contents of the parentheses are currently a fraction, but my goal is to make the contents of the parentheses a subtraction problem. So somehow I have to transform the inside of the parentheses from a fraction to a subtraction problem. This is one of our algebraic maneuvers. We can split that fraction down here into the difference of two fractions and then use identities to get us to our final goal. So I can see the path to the end. The path to the end now is to do an algebra move where we separate the fraction into the difference of two fractions and then use uh, identities to create cotangent and cosecant. Now, I'm gonna have to do a different share. So if you didn't watch a video previously, then you didn't see this, okay? But for now, I'm just gonna pick up where we left off. Where we left off with was one minus cosine of x squared. Excuse me, that's not where we left off with. We were here and then we condensed this into one squared by sneaking the, cos the sine into the parentheses because the sine had a square on it. And this is where we're picking up from. 
All right, so now we can split this into two fractions by giving each term in the numerator its own common denominator of sine of x and then putting the minus in between. Again, that's an algebra move. And then we're almost done because the one over sine of x is, sec is uh, excuse me, cosecant of x. I can s resurrect that. And then cosine of x over sine of x is cotangent of x. Now, if I were citing this, I would have to say two things. I would I used a reciprocal identity on the first one, and I used a quotient identity on the second one. So, yeah, I actually pushed this from the left to the right unexpectedly. I was expecting to manipulate both sides individually. In other words, I was expecting to transform the left side into something, transform the right side of something, and meet in the middle. But... By focusing on the structure of the right side of the equation, the squared subtraction problem, the minute I got a squared subtraction problem in the numerator, I capitalized on that by transforming the right side into a square of a fraction and then transforming it into the square of a subtraction problem by splitting the fraction and then trigonometry took care of the rest. It's not the only approach to do it. It's just the approach that I took.